do one want to take the risk of bleeding uh, in the uh, patients who are at risk for bleeding and patients who have liver disease so that traversing the liver may be difficult, either focal or diffuse. And it is easier to do in those patients where the gallbladder is markedly distended or dilated and is sitting right next to the uh, parietal uh, peritoneum. And uh, this may also be used for extraction of the stone or lithotripsy because extraction of the stone may dilate, you may need to dilate the tract even larger than the catheter itself, and you don't want to do that through the uh, liver parenchyma. Now, in the, uh, in the transperitoneal approach, it is important, very important, to remember that you're not going to go through the loops of bowel. And transperitoneal approach is actually um, uh, in, in, under ultrasound control, sometimes you may not be able to visualize clearly uh, collapsed loop of bowel. So therefore, you want to make every effort to make sure that there is no interposition of the bowel loop in the track of the uh, catheter on the track of the approach from the skin uh, subcutaneous tissue, here is the muscle layer, and then into the gallbladder, there, there are no loops of bowel. So you want to avoid that because if you do that, then you not only perforate the bowel and spillage of bowel uh, contents into the peritoneal cavity, but also risk of leakage of bile into the uh, peritoneal cavity. The other issue is that it takes about six weeks for the tract to mature before you can take the catheter out. As we said before, uh, cholecystostomy actually is a temporizing procedure. It's not curative. And eventually you have to take the gallbladder, uh, the gallbladder catheter out of the gallbladder so that uh, further management can happen. And you have to wait for the tract to mature. For example, if you're passing the catheter from skin to the gallbladder, the, around the part of the uh, gallbladder, uh, around part of the catheter that is passing between the gallbladder and the skin, that tract needs to close, otherwise the leakage of bile can occur. So here is the uh, uh, approach without transhepatic, transperitoneal approach, dilated gallbladder right next to the anterior abdominal wall, and you can uh, see the, uh, the, again, under real-time ultrasound control, you can see the, gall, uh, the catheter going into the gallbladder and uh, the catheter and the needle with the trocar technique and a loop has been formed uh, in the gallbladder. Uh, now, there are two approaches to... You have any, anybody has any question? So the, uh, there are two approaches to uh, entering any cavity within the body. Uh, it, either a blood vessel where, or uh, um, let's say uh, cystostomy or gastrostomy. There are two techniques. One is the Seldinger technique and other is the Trocar technique. Seldinger is when you place a needle and replace it with guide wire Which and place the catheter over the guide wire into the cavity for drainage. Trocar technique is when you have the uh, catheter uh, over a uh, needle or an trocar, and you uh, insert the whole assembly through the skin into the uh, into the cavity. Okay. Uh, all right. So here is the here is the uh, Saldinger technique. You place the needle first, then you place the uh, wire through the needle. Take the needle out. Then in place of the needle, you place the catheter over the wire because you already have access uh, into the cavity, into the gallbladder in this case, over the wire. Once the catheter has entered the gallbladder and then the wire is taken out and the catheter is left within the gallbladder uh, for drainage. Now this access may be done either with a normal size needle through which uh, uh, the guide wire can pass, or it may be started with micropuncture needle 
and then uh, tract dilated and the gallbladder is uh, drained in that manner. So either of the two uh, is okay. And then very important to secure the catheter because it is not uncommon. Uh, actually, it does happen that the patients are sick, they are septic, they actually may not be fully conscious and they might unknowingly pull the catheter out or when they turn in the bed or when the nurses turn them in the bed, the catheter may get pulled out. Pulled out catheter it can, is a disaster if it, is, if it happens in the first uh, few days. Um, then the trocar technique, as we were saying before, where the catheter is over the needle. So you pass the whole assembly, the catheter and the needle uh, across uh, the skin into the gallbladder. And you uh, once the catheter is inside, you push the catheter over the needle and pull the needle out and leaving the catheter within the, uh, within the gallbladder for drainage. Now, this technique, of course, can be used for any body cavity that is available or uh, where indication for uh, uh, fluid drainage may be uh, uh, necessary. An abscess cavity, and a superficial abscess cavity is perfectly suited for this kind of uh, trocar technique. And once the uh, catheter is in place, uh, securing the catheter with suture to the skin or with stay fix or with tapes in such a way that inadvertent pulling of the catheter out by the patient or the nurse or anybody else is, uh, is not uh, possible or at least becomes difficult. The advantage of uh, putting a, a stitch in the skin and anchoring the catheter is that when the stitch gets pulled, the patient experiences pain and draws patient's attention to the, uh, uh, to the catheter, and then it sometimes is secured. In the past, there was fluoroscopic guidance. Under fluoroscopy, uh, catheter was placed in the gallbladder, provided the gallbladder contains opaque calculi and you target the opaque calculi because there is no other way to opacify a gallbladder if it is diseased because either it is not contracting in a calcular cholecystitis or if the cystic duct is obstructed. So the only way to outline the gallbladder would be uh, if there are opaque calculi. But this technique is no longer used because you cannot define the confines and the borders of the gallbladder to see uh, where you are. And you really don't want to enter the um, gallbladder without knowing and because of the risk of uh, peritoneal spilling. Now, once the catheter is placed and uh, inflammation uh, uh, subsides, uh, the, if there is a stone, the stone usually passes into the uh, body of the gallbladder, the inflammation uh, subsides, and you check uh, the uh, uh, you check what you call the cholecystostogram. Cholecystostogram is means that you're actually injecting water soluble contrast into the gallbladder uh, through the cholecystostomy tube to outline the gallbladder for its anatomy or its pathology in terms of stones or in terms of any uh, other filling defect and see whether the cystic duct is open. Now, if the cystic duct is open, that means that the gallbladder will, is not obstructed and that the pressure of the gallbladder will, will not increase and therefore the risk of leakage of gallbladder from the site of entry of the catheter will not occur. And enough time has passed for the, uh, for the tract to epithelialize, which is like uh, three to six weeks, depending on the approach. Then you, uh, the patient is ready to uh, have the catheter taken out and a uh, patient can then either uh, stay, uh, that is the treatment if there are no stones, if there are stones, 
then the patient can go for surgery or a patient go for surgery with catheter in place as long as the inflammation is, is, is uh, resolved. So the surgeon can then take the gallbladder out along with the catheter and everybody is happy. So we uh, have this experience, we uh, like to share with you uh, experience of about 120, in fact, 120 patients with cholecystostomy. And look at this, a majority of the patients are uh, over 60 years of age, mean is about 70 years. There are occasional patients who are younger, but majority of the patient are older. The younger patients are usually those who are in the hospital for other than liver or gallbladder reasons things like head injuries or um, multiple uh, road traffic accident trauma, and they are on uh, parental uh, management uh, for a long time and develop acalcular cholecystitis. And to relieve that, we do uh, uh, the uh, cholecystostomy in order to avoid chance of infection. But in the large majority of patients, uh, there is lot of comorbidities in our patients, 80 patients had cardiac disease, 30 had pulmonary, 26 had renal disease, 20 had sepsis, although all of them have some element of sepsis, but sepsis in these 20 patients was overwhelming. 18 GI condition, and out of 120, nearly half had multiple morbidities uh, uh, for which cholecystostomy was, uh, was done. Um, it is important before doing cholecystostomy to check the patient's INR. INR is, as you know, is the international normalizing ratio, is an indication of ability of blood to clot. And if the uh, INR uh, is higher, then those patients need to receive either fresh frozen plasma or blood or platelets in order for any, uh, they need any support for uh, the coagulation. And uh, our department had 1.5 uh, INR as at a cutoff uh, below which we would do the procedure um, without any uh, FFP, uh, fresh frozen plasma above which we would give fresh frozen plasma in order to reduce the risk of, of bleeding. In 20 out of 120 patients, uh, we required the fresh frozen plasma uh, because their, uh, sorry, uh, because their uh, INR was higher than 1.5. The other uh, measure to look at is the platelets. We do not do procedures at a platelet less than 50,000. And uh, if the patient's platelet is less, then we ask them to ask the clinician to give uh, packed cell volume and plate packed cell platelets uh, before uh, doing the procedure and uh, actually do the procedure as these uh, fresh frozen plasma platelets are going uh, into the patient and uh, through the drip. So it's important to um, not unduly risk the procedure if the, uh, you know, do the uh, risk of complications of bleeding in order to uh, try and treat one thing, you give another, uh, another complications. So in uh, 120 patients, uh, they were majority of these patients, as you see, are eight, uh, 78 of them were uh, the uh, had uh, colis, uh, acalcular cholecystitis, and only uh, 40, uh, 40 of them had calcular cholecystitis. Look at this, uh, majority of them did not have uh, Murphy's sign uh, positive, and uh, the uh, and uh, the the twenty in twenty of them it was uh, uncertain and seven were excluded because the CT uh, demonstrated uh, the finding. The gallbladder was not always markedly distended. The average was about four centimeter. 
um, the, but, uh, you know, from two to uh, seven centimeters. The larger the gall bladder, the easier it is for us to put the, uh, to put the catheter in. Uh, the thickness of the gall bladder, which normally is about two millimeters, it was as thick as about 5.5 millimeter, up to 13 millimeters thick. The thicker the gallbladder wall, the more chance there is of sloughing and perforation unless it is fibrotic. So in the, of the 120, we did uh, the, uh, uh, there were some bedside and uh, in the radiology department. Bedside means that you take the ultrasound machine with you to the bedside of the patient in the inpatient or emergency department. Then you go ahead and uh, do the procedure under real time ultrasound uh, in the patient's bed. The majority of our cases we did under trocar uh, technique, uh, where catheter and the needle are introduced as one set into the gallbladder, and also majority of the uh, catheter were of eighty uh, catheter out of one hundred and twenty, about two thirds of the catheter were eight French, there were some six French and there are some 10 French. Eight French is probably best suited because it is of enough thickness that it does not break uh, when left in the gallbladder for, for three to four to six weeks. Uh, 10 French is also okay, except that it may make a bigger hole into the, uh, into the liver passing through, through it. Uh, we left the catheter in uh, uh, three days to 36 weeks, and on the average, uh, about uh, seven weeks. Uh, so, uh, and the reason that certain patients have the only three days, while we said catheter must be left, left for uh, three to six weeks, because these patients uh, uh, went to surgery. And um, the catheter was taken out. Uh, in 21 patients, which is about 15% of the patient has catheter dislodged in two weeks. And this is what I was talking about, uh, that uh, dislodgement of the catheter is very important complications. And you must, must, must secure the catheter because you have produced a, produced a hole in the gallbladder. You don't want that hole to leak the bile into the peritoneal cavity. In, major, in half, about half of these patients, less than half of these patients, catheter was uh, replaced because the gallbladder was, was still distended. And in, in 12, uh, catheter was not replaced because the gallbladder was not distended and the uh, stone in the, um, and the obstruction to the cystic duct was relieved and uh, the patient was observed for complications and uh, no, no catheter was, uh, was replaced. But it is not desirable at all to uh, have the catheter taken out. Very important again, to secure the catheter. If one thing, if two things you have learned from this, one, is not to take the risk of bleeding and check the INR and platelet. And second, to secure the catheter, uh, you will be a safe uh, individual. So the follow-up in, in those patients, uh, 54 patients, uh, nearly half of the patient improved. Uh, in 23, there was, uh, uh, there was no improvement. Um, but in certain number of patients, there were uh, no do documentation was inadequate uh, as to what happened because this is a retrospective study. There were 12 deaths and not related to the procedure, but related to the fact that majority of the patients are seriously ill and have uh, comorbidities and uh, 12 of them died, which is, which is a lot, which is like 10% of the whole population, which is a very large uh, number, but this is not due to the procedure and uh, due to the uh, comorbidity. Uh, and uh, about 29 patients had a follow-up 
uh, of uh, cholecystectomies, uh, about one fourth of these patients has cholecystectomy at the hospital. Many of these patients were referred from other hospitals and other clinics, and therefore uh, they were kind of lost to follow up as to what happened to the gallbladder because we are a referral, referral center. Now the complication, the complications, obviously bleeding is a complication every time you place a, a needle anywhere in the body. Now bradycardia is an important complication because as you know, uh, vagal mediated hypotension because the upper abdomen is uh, 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 innervated by vagus nerve. Uh, although it occurs uncommonly and rarely because patients are too sick, but one should needs to keep an eye on that eventuality and be ready with atropine injection. But, uh, uh, biliary peritonitis is a real complication as we have been talking about which may be due to catheter dislodgement or kinking or obstruction of the catheter. When the catheter is kinked, uh, it obviously does not drain. The pressure in the gallbladder increases and that there is leakage of bile through the hole in the gallbladder where catheter is passing through. Or sometimes stones in the gallbladder may lodge in the, into the catheter if there are multiple small stones and then can obstruct the catheter. And therefore, it is important in the maintaining maintenance of the catheter is to flush the catheter twice a day with five uh, cc's of saline, making sure that when you inject the saline through the catheter into the gallbladder, you're able to aspirate at least the same amount or more uh, back from the gallbladder, indicating the catheter is open. Keeping the catheter open is an important uh, nursing measure, and they should be taught to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, and here is the contrast, which is uh, outside of the uh, biliary tree into the peritoneal cavity uh, as a result of uh, cholecystostomy uh, uh, contrast in the peritoneal, where the catheter has been dislodged outside of the uh, gallbladder, or sometime a uh, side hole of the catheter may be, because as you know, there are several side holes in the catheter, at one at the end and then many side holes. Some of the side holes may be outside the gallbladder, and others inside the gallbladder and may cause leakage of the contents of the uh, gallbladder. Now, many times the catheter may, in fact, uh, after correct placement, the catheter may dislodge out of the uh, gallbladder. And the reason for that is that if you're going through uh, the peritoneal cavity if you're going through the liver or going, uh, you know, directly transperitoneal, the liver moves with respiration and abdominal wall fixes the catheter through which it passes. So if the uh, breathing is such and the, gall and the uh, catheter is in a position where it moves with breathing, then uh, it can dislodge or can get pulled out. And therefore, one must um, leave a certain additional length of catheter into the gallbladder so that when breathing occurs, it does not get pulled out. So every time patient takes a deep breath, uh, uh, you know, catheter obviously becomes uh, tense or even gets pulled out a little bit. But when the uh, patient uh, relaxes, the, uh, the catheter does not go back because it is tightly fitted into the um, gallbladder, uh, into the either gallbladder wall or liver or peritoneal cavity. So breathing will pull the catheter out, but uh, expiration, inspiration might pull the catheter out a little bit, but expiration will not place it back in because the catheter is tightly fit into the, uh, uh, into the track. So after deployment, 
the catheter can in fact uh, move uh, out, out of at the edge of the gallbladder, and it was not it, edge of the, and it was not draining uh, as well as it was, it was intended to drain. And here is a patient uh, with uh, increasing fluid into the peritoneal cavity. You see the uh, liver. Uh, there's the coronal section, the liver, transhepatic placement of the gallbladder, and this is large amount of fluid around the uh, liver. Over here, no fluid when the catheter is placed. Over here, large amount of fluid in the uh, peritoneal cavity, suggesting uh, leakage of bile and peritonitis because when small amount of bile leaks, it causes inflammation and exudation and oozing of fluid from the peritoneal surface so that the amount of fluid in the peritoneal cavity increases sharply, much more than the uh, leakage, indicating that there is... Uh, uh, and then this fluid can be uh, uh, sampled to see whether it contains bile or not. If it contains bile, then one can be certain that there is a leakage of uh, bile around the catheter. Here is the nuclear medicine which uh, scan, which demonstrate persistent activity outside the edge of the liver on delayed scan. Here is the dynamic passing contrast passing through the liver and the gallbladder. And then uh, outside of the gallbladder and the liver, this sliver of activity persists, indicating that there is leakage of uh, of the bile or gallbladder contents into the uh, peritoneal cavity in the, in the gallbladder bed. Now, sometimes uh, when you place the needle or a catheter in the gallbladder, uh, you may pass through the gallbladder and not able to leave you may pass through the gallbladder wall into the lumen and may not be able to leave the catheter in for certain technical reasons. But remember, once you have perforated the gallbladder wall and made a hole in it, it is potential leak for, for leakage of bile into the peritoneal cavity. Therefore, you must empty the gallbladder, aspirate the gallbladder uh, so that before it fills, the uh, the uh, hole in the or the perforation, if you will, hole in the gallbladder wall has time to seal from blood and other uh, natural uh, mechanism. So don't leave a distended gallbladder with a hole in it because it can cause uh, peritoneal uh, 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 the bile leakage, the dreaded uh, bile leakage. So that, and then. If the ultrasound is not successful as a guidance, then uh, either a CT scan uh, can be uh, done with much more accuracy, accuracy in placement of the catheter into the gallbladder or get a senior with more experience to do this or just put a, put a needle into the gallbladder and aspirate and uh, wait for uh, uh, wait for another uh, another moment. Now, sometimes what happens is uh, under ultrasound, you place the gallbladder, the, uh, the catheter into the gallbladder nicely. You're very happy the catheter is in there. But actually, in following ultrasound, on following uh, uh, check CT, you actually pass through the gallbladder across through the far wall and outside of the gallbladder in the, uh, uh, you actually counterpunctured the gallbladder without knowing an ultrasound. And that is one of the uh, drawbacks of ultrasound, uh, especially when you're doing transperitoneal and particularly when you want to avoid the, uh, you, particularly when you want to avoid uh, the, uh, the bowel loose because you cannot tell. So, this can pass. Now, if this happens and patient is fine and catheter is draining, uh, then you do nothing because it is uh, the side holes over here 
uh, decompress the pressure within the gallbladder. And since there is nothing here to decompress, you may not, you may not, in fact, uh, have leakage through the holes at the end of the catheter. In this situation, you can apply a little bit of suction, continuous suction in such a way that the gallbladder is always being aspirated uh, through, the, through the side hole. Now, if the first catheter is in the wrong place, do not pull this out. Put another catheter on top of this and uh, so that the gallbladder is empty and the holes in the gallbladder uh, <clears throat> do not uh, leak uh, fluid. And here's the situation in the same patient that we just saw here. Gallbladder catheter is going across as we saw, and then we leave it the catheter there, but we place a second catheter uh, in order to decompress the gallbladder. Once the gallbladder decompressed, you can take, you can either leave this for some time or you can take this out because now the gallbladder is being drained by the, uh, by the other catheter. Now, another very important thing that if the gallbladder is not diseased and it is normal, it will be very difficult to pass uh, the catheter into a normal floppy thin wall gallbladder because it is not distended enough in, uh, to allow the catheter to pass through unless you're passing through the <coughs> liver parenchyma and the gallbladder is obviously uh, extra peritoneal uh, about small amount of gallbladder is extra peritoneal uh, with the liver and uh, you can pass through it, but then catheter will not be able to go in and sometime it will pass across onto the other side. So, uh, trying to drain a normal gallbladder is a very difficult job, remember, and uh, one should not do that. Now, sometimes uh, the, when the gallbladder is very thick walled and you're placing the uh, trocar or the needle, there is tenting, there is pushing in of the gallbladder wall. What you really need to do in this case, once you reach this point, you make a jerky movement <clears throat> in order to penetrate through the gallbladder wall to place the uh, uh, catheter inside. Now, if the catheter comes out uh, three weeks or four weeks later, it generally is easy to place the catheter through the tract that has already matured. Uh, what you need to do is to inject some saline into the tract without a catheter distend the catheter and then gradually uh, place a catheter with hand into the uh, track and push it and usually it will work for for you if indeed drainage of the catheter is a uh, drainage of the gallbladder is still required um, you know uh, transcolonic placement of the catheter again as we said before uh, you know, if you're not careful, if you want to do transperitoneal uh, <clears throat> uh, placement, you can unknowingly place the catheter through the bowel. And in this case, the catheter was placed transcolonically, and <clears throat> which is not a good thing. But once it's transcolonic, and if it is working, uh, the best thing is to leave it alone and the deal with it after everything has been matured. Uh, bleeding, of course, uh, can occur. And, you know, when bleeding occurs and you have checked the INR and the platelets, uh, it really is uh, uh, by chance that bleeding might occur. Uh, there's nothing really you can do. The only thing you can do is to uh, do the procedure perfectly. There will always be certain amount of number of patients who will bleed. And here is the liver parenchyma. Here is the hematoma subcapsular hematoma with contained within the liver uh, capsule and causing compression of the liver parenchyma. And here's the, uh, here's the blood. You see the density of the uh, fluid is more than fluid uh, water from liver to here. Large subcapsular hematoma can occur. 
Occasionally, you'll have some bleeding into the peritoneal cavity also. But of course, that is a complication that one can, <clears throat> one can, um, one should be ready for. Now, if the uh, gallbladder, uh, if you have cholecystostomy tube, which is draining, <clears throat> you might in fact see on cholecystostogram that common duct is still full of stones, even though the gallbladder may be collapsed after drainage. In those situations, do not take the uh, tube out uh, and have uh, the treatment for the common duct uh, stones be completed before taking the catheter out. Because if you take the catheter out, the stones might uh, obstruct and back up and is distend the gallbladder and cause leakage of the uh, uh, leakage of the uh, bile into the peritoneal cavity. And the treatment for the stone uh, can be done <clears throat> through the ERCP or by other means. And therefore the <clears throat> catheter in the gallbladder needs to stay. <clears throat> well, the other uh, complications are um, that you can have a uh, pigtail uh, partly <clears throat> into the migrate out of the uh, gallbladder as we have uh, uh, talked, uh, talked about this before. And then uh, also we talked about what to do if the gallbladder, uh, if the catheter is migrated totally outside or is still inside. So <clears throat> in conclusion, in summary, uh, I just wanted uh, everybody to um, know that the salient features of doing safe cholecystostomy is planning. Planning your route, first of all, uh, pre-procedure uh, screening for bleeding, and secondly, planning for a safe route from the skin to the gallbladder, either through the liver or transperitoneally and shortest and the safest. Now, the other point I just wanted to mention that you can go, you cannot go through aerated lung, but you can go through interco lower intercostal space where the aerated lung is not present and the uh, peritoneal and the, uh, uh, the uh, pleural cavity is collapsed. The lung has retracted up and the poor pleural cavity is collapsed. As you know, that in expiration, the uh, pleura reaches up to the 10th rib posteriorly, uh, eighth rib and uh, mid axillary line and sixth rib anteriorly. So, <clears throat> the, uh, so when you place the catheter through a collapsed pleura and not the aerated lung, you are relatively safe and a uh, chance of uh, spillage into the uh, into the pleural cavity is is very little and the securing of the catheter is extremely important as we have uh, repeatedly discussed today and taking the catheter out in three to six weeks is the uh, time point uh, for safe removal of the catheter either after uh, um, uh, the a patient has completely recovered or uh, the patient's uh, infection has completely gone. Uh, and the ca eight French catheter is the most favored <clears throat> uh, size of catheter and trocar technique under ultrasound is most commonly performed once you have practiced enough. But before doing that, CT guidance may be a good way to start uh, under uh, direct vision almost uh, and a good way to start before you become expert and start doing the ultrasound guided. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, we can start that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. So uh, there are a lot of questions that uh, have been uh, uh, asked. So, uh, Dr. Abiza said, uh, just wanted to confirm if I got you correct, is for transplantic approach, track maturation, three to four weeks, and it trans retonio six weeks? Correct. 
And then uh, someone also, he asked again, when do you give the FP for Yanara is it more than 1.5? Is it overnight right. or two hours before the procedure? Okay, so very good question. That's excellent. First of all, um, you have to make your own policy. Uh, there are certain uh, departments who will uh, give FFP even if it is more than 1.0, like 1.1. There are certain departments who will take 1.8 as the upper limit. That's one question, that one uh, statement. The FFP, uh, what we used to do for every Zero, uh, every 0.2 increase in the uh, INR, uh, we will give one FFP. That means if our limit is 1.5, uh, and if the, uh, if, if the INR is 1.7 or 1.8, let's say we'll give one FFP. If it is 1.9, we'll give two. If it is 2.2, we'll give four, okay. That's number one. Number two, <clears throat> what we used to do, what we do is that we give FFP and FFP takes a little time to go in. And it takes about 45 minutes, half an hour to 45 minutes. And uh, if we were going to give three FFP, we bring the patient down to the department when the third FFP has started and half of it has gone. So that at the time when you're doing the procedure, there is the highest concentration of fresh frozen plasma in the blood. Because as soon as you have finished giving fresh frozen plasma, its level starts coming down slowly over a period of time. So the maximum concentration of uh, fresh frozen plasma and its action is at the time when the last drop of the last a uh, uh, bag of FFP has gone in. So you really want to do the procedure under the umbrella of FFP when the maximum concentration is there. So um, I think now you have also given the recommended dose. Um, well, recommended dose of FFP, yeah. For as I said, you can decide for yourself for uh, you know, zero anything above uh, two or three uh, points above uh, uh, the your normal, you can give one FFP. Also, someone also wanted to also to know duration of when to give FFP before the procedure. I think also you answered that. Well, the, the duration, as I said, you start the FFP. And when the last drop of FFP is going in, that's when you do the procedure because that's when the highest concentration of FFP is in the blood. Okay. So um, the other one uh, asked about what do you do if the catheter is not draining anymore after one week? Should you remove it okay. or wait? For no, security? definitely not. You don't remove a catheter after one week in any under circumstances. You actually image, you do an ultrasound and see whether the gallbladder is distended or not. Sometime what can happen is that the cystic duct is obstructed, you've drained the gallbladder and the gallbladder is no longer receiving the bile uh, from the uh, biliary, biliary system and therefore it has drained and no, nothing is coming out if the gallbladder is collapsed. You leave the catheter in until it matures, you know, three to, uh, three to four weeks or six weeks as the case may be. And then they take the catheter out because if you take the catheter out and the cystic duct opens after you take the catheter out, you have a risk of uh, leakage. Okay. Um... Another question was, after placement of gallbladder catheter, after six weeks and the patient has improved, uh, and if you do a cholangiogram, the cholecystogram, and you find that there is a patent cystic and a common bile duct. So what are the procedure to remove the catheter? 
Yes. So when the catheter is all ready to remove, remember when you put the catheter in, you have made the uh, pigtail and fix the pigtail so that the catheter doesn't get out. So you have to undo the pigtail, either cutting the string or cutting the catheter near the hub and then pulling the catheter out so that you're not pulling up a locked pigtail through the, uh, to the track. So um, another question was, how can I determine if the track has matured. Okay, only time. Uh, you, you, there's no other way to mature, only time, uh, because, it's, because experience has told us that it takes three weeks uh, for the um, catheter to mature uh, or, or uh, you know, six weeks transperitoneal, three to four weeks transhepatic. Uh, there's no other way to tell. So, um... Then the other question was, is there patient factor that can cause delayed tract maturation? Uh, yes, well, certainly, you know, if the patient is, uh, the patient is very sick, if the patient has, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> uh, lots and lots of ascites and the fluid can is continue to leak through the uh, uh, the track uh, to the entry of the catheter into the peritoneal cavity, yes, uh, that can happen. But in those situations, you have to take care of the, uh, you know, you have to take care of the, uh, uh, the uh, ascites itself. So, um, there is, uh, I think I, if I got you correctly, uh, can we do cholecystostomy uh, on a coagulopathic patient? Well, the, the very good question. The thing is that, you know, you can take a risk, uh, calculated risk. If, for example, you have a patient who is uh, impending rupture of the gallbladder clinically, and you have, um, let's say, 1.8 or 2, then um, you have to discuss with the referring physician and the family and talk to them and say, look, if we don't do it, the patient is going to die. And if we do it, then the patient has a risk of bleeding. Then you have to weigh the risk. Once you have weighed the risk, then you can actually perform under the uh, agreement of the referring physician and the uh, patient's family. You can always do that because we, that we are doctors. We make decisions and we judge the uh, risks and benefits. And if the benefit is slightly more than the risk, then we can, uh, uh, you know, we can perform the procedure. But it's certainly not advisable to do so. If you are performing the procedure under, uh, under uh, risk of bleeding, then make sure that your placement of catheter is very clean and only one, uh, you know, one shot in order to place the catheter. Because if you were to uh, poke several times, then obviously the chance of uh, bleeding and disaster is much higher.